Hello and welcome to the new episode of the podcast. Today I am super excited to be bringing Gabrielle Ortega into this conversation. She is a holistic mental health coach and owner and founder of the OM Therapy Coaching. And she also is working on the Doctorate of Psychology, no less. So <laughs> I think we will have uh, a treat today by talking to her about mental health and taking care of our bodies and our minds. Welcome to You Can Exhale Now, a mindful living podcast for the modern pace, hosted by Lesia Liu. This podcast is for anyone who wants to get more out of life without the burnout. Because when you learn to take proper care of yourself, you have more energy, a more positive outlook, and more gratitude for life. And because you cannot reach your goals if you're tired, overwhelmed, judgmental, angry, and feel sorry for yourself. Each episode, you will learn actionable strategies for self-care, mental health, productivity, better life, work balance, and happiness from coaches, therapists, and experts. Stop holding your breath. You can exhale now. Choose to be a more authentic version of yourself than you've been in a while. Gabrielle, I want to welcome you on the show. And why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more? Hi, awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I am a mental health coach. I'm based out in Los Angeles, California. And I just primarily really love psychology and helping people discover themselves for the first time. <laughs> um, I like to call it like a self-awakening process. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So basically, I kind of got started doing all this work um, when I was engaged in my own healing process. Uh, I think most of us have different parts of our lives that weren't so great or weren't so easy. And of course, they kind of leak into the rest of your life as an adult. And, um, you know, at a certain point, I got to a place in my life where I really wanted to understand that more. I wanted to understand why I had the personality I had, why I was having the difficulties I was having. I had seen therapists before. Um, my mom is actually a psychologist herself, so I'm very familiar oh, with this so it's whole in the family. Field. Yeah, yeah, it definitely runs in the family. We're both very passionate about understanding how the mind works. Um, and so, yeah, so I ended up going on this kind of deep healing journey. I went back to school, got my master's in psychology because I had previously been an artist. Um, a performer, and I kind of just really dove into all things about our mind, our unconscious, um, what drives us every single day, and, and it was kind of shocking. And I wanted to immediately bring this to everybody because there's no reason why you should have to go see a therapist to get this kind of very basic information about understanding yourself because it's not about mental illness, I found most of the time. I would say like, 95% of the time, it's because we just haven't been taught how to understand our emotions. We don't understand our minds, our brains um, from a biological perspective, but also from a kind of soul-centered perspective um, and a heart-centered perspective. So it's, it's interesting. And so my work really combines a lot of different um, modalities. So we look at a holistic perspective of mental health with my clients, which means we don't just look at the psychology part of it. We also look at how, are, how does your brain actually work? Um, what was the evolutionary reasoning for having things like anxiety? It's a lot of education around your body as well and your body-mind connection, how to integrate health to create a healthy gut biome, um, which our biome contains 500 million neurons. So if we're not giving it what it needs, we don't give it the good bacteria that helps us maintain mental wellness. So things like depression and anxiety have been known to sometimes start with bad gut health. So it's really important to understand we're just very connected. Um, we are very complicated machines. And if we're ever going to figure out how to be truly happy on a day-to-day -day basis and not in the state of, oh my God, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when I get that job, when I get that promotion, when I take that vacation, when I find that perfect partner, that's never going to happen, first of all. Second of all, um, we need to really figure out how to be happy right now because we don't know what tomorrow brings. 
And, you know, and I think that that is really what it boils down to. It's not even about mental, like mental illness or mental health. It's about kind of this whole person, whole spirit, whole soul kind of integrated health and Mm -hmm. happiness that we can bring into our daily life. I absolutely love it. And I wanted to just comment, I absolutely love that you are approaching it from this holistic uh, point of view, because when we're talking about mental health and mental illnesses specifically, there's still a, a lot of stigma around mental health, but it really comes from a lot of like physical things right Uh, our physical brain other physical Mm -hmm. elements like hormones and injuries you know especially to the brain and even like what we put into our bodies our uh, gut biome and our nutrition and yet we seem to think about mental health always as a separate from our own physical body yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's really funny because um, as I'm continuing to learn about the field of psychology, it's very, it's a very new field. Um, I mean, we're talking about the last 50 years, it really just even came up. So um, in terms of popularity, I mean, it was created maybe at the turn of the 19th century. Um, but it's been, it's a relatively new science, right? Because it's been a theory this whole time until we've had the actual access to technology to really look and see how these different theories really play out in the body and the brain and to understand the connection that there is that really integral connection between the body, how it processes emotions and how it supports your mental health and your mind and your brain and the evolutionary part of it. And Um, yeah, it's just, I'm very passionate about connecting all those dots because I think that's where we're headed. And it's really exciting because there are a few other therapists, especially of the newer generations who are coming up from this and and learning this new perspective. But again, it's the technology. We just didn't have the brain scanning technology and the MRIs and the gut technology and all that stuff to really understand and put the pieces together until literally right now. So this is kind of the revolution and I definitely see mental health completely shifting in the next 20 years Um, but I also don't want to wait for it to get there so that's why I just decided you want to be on the forefront yeah yeah absolutely a hundred percent I definitely think this is a battle for sure because like you said there is so much stigma and I have had my own bouts with depression I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder from my own background my own childhood experiences I struggled for a long time and I thought something was wrong with me. And again, my, when I was a therapist, same thing, my clients thought something was really wrong with them. And it was mostly just about saying, okay, this is what happened. Let's first process that and see how you feel about that. Then let's understand the context, right? So your brain has physically changed when you experience these mental kind of distressing situations. So you are more anxious and you are more prone to be sensitive. Like there's certain things that happen that are completely out of your control. And when it comes to understanding that, you gain that power back. And that's so important. Absolutely. I love it. And to be honest, I can completely relate to it in my own experience where uh, I was diagnosed with anxiety, but for a few years prior to getting the diagnosis and not even thinking that I had anxiety, I just felt that there's just something wrong with me, something is broken. And then mm-hmm. I think it empowers you to understand really what's going on with you. And that puts less pressure onto yourself. You know, there's less judgment. Mm-hmm. And I think then that's, that's the way to end stigma too, because I think it starts from within because we feel, yeah. we feel judged by others, by ourselves. There's some type of guilt around that. So I absolutely can relate to that experience. So yeah. said that, <laughs> what's the first step to decode our brains and how do we without maybe going to a therapist, are there <laughs> other ways to understand your brain better, uh, to understand your behaviors, your personality, why are you acting certain ways? Why are people, some people rubbing you the wrong way? Uh, (laughs) How do you go about really explaining to yourself what your brain is doing and how it's trying to protect you? 
Absolutely. So there's kind of a couple of things. So the first thing is I always say self-education is the most powerful thing you can do. Um, go, I have an Amazon book list that has, I think over 40 books on different aspects of the self-healing process. And I've read all of them <laughs> and I'm a total nerd. Um, but I definitely think reliable educational information about how the mind works, psychology, happiness. Um, again, those books are a great resource to get started. Doing that kind of work for yourself is going to be number one. Um, then I think it's about what the actual work, um, if you're not ju just educating yourself at the, at the moment, um, would be to really start learning how to become the observer of your experience. And this really plays into meditation and mindfulness and um, the kind of idea that your emotions are there for information, right? They're there to tell you what's going on, if something is okay or not okay for you, if there's an unhealed wound that needs to be attended to, um, or if you have a desire for something, if you have a need that needs to be met. So your emotions are, are just information. And what we do is we tend to identify with them and we say, oh, I'm so angry. I'm an angry person or I'm so, you know, um, self-conscious. I don't have any confidence. Yeah. And it becomes your identity, just like saying some, giving someone a diagnosis, which again, it's a whole other topic for a whole other day about diagnosis, <laughs> but telling someone like you said, you know, I have anxiety or you have an anxiety disorder. It's like, well, now they, be that becomes their identity or a lot of people tend to do that. And they say, oh, well, I'm just an anxious person. I'm going to be this way forever. And, um, and the truth is that you don't, it, that's not true. You definitely don't have to be. So mm -hmm. when you can kind of, in those moments where you feel triggered, right? We have a knee jerk, something happens. We have a knee jerk kind of emotional reaction. And then we have a knee jerk behavioral response. So someone says something you don't like, you immediately snap back at them with something, I don't know, defensive, um, aggressive. You get, you basically get triggered and you're like, this person is attacking me. I'm going to say something to attack back without thinking about it. And then you do it. And then you find yourself maybe having like bad relationships or having these patterns that keep happening that you don't want to happen. Um, so it's about in those moments where something is happening to you, you're feeling emotionally triggered. It's about taking a real, like really, it's so, it's so hard, but taking a pause and even if it means you're having a conversation with someone and you're feeling something and you don't know what it is and just literally just say, Hey, you know what? I need five. Uh, and just take yourself out of the, out of the room. If, 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 and sometimes that's really where it starts is actually isolating yourself for a few minutes to breathe, to assess and say, okay, what am I responding to? What are the feelings that are coming up? What do I want to do? And is this in my highest self's best interest? Absolutely. And yeah, that's, that's really the bulk of that work. It's separating from the emotions and realizing that you can be the observer and you have the ability to choose how you respond in an empowering way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think so many people, I mean, we are, no one is ideal, so I, I probably would be accurate if I say that 100% of the people still sometimes, you know, are, let our emotions get the best out of us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people become like, prisoner of their emotions and their feelings hence you know uh, maybe there's fear uh, or like a sense of perfectionism or maybe we procrastinate because we are waiting to be inspired uh, or mo motivated to do something and what do you suggest for people to do when they feel like they are becoming a prisoner of their own emotions of their feelings if they just cannot find uh, that spark of creativity, uh, or they just cannot shake off like being angry at somebody. What do you say? Yeah. So this is when I love to plug self-care. <laughs> it is the foundation for everything that you want for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, whenever we're feeling burned out or drained or not inspired, or we're feeling symptoms of depression coming back, um, we're not wanting to get out of bed or do our normal fun things. Um, that means that you're not engaging in enough self-care, which most of us aren't. Um, we're not really taught how to do it. There's all kinds of areas of our life that need self-care. Um, of course, we know face masks, great, bubble baths, cool. Um, but really the deep self-care is knowing yourself enough to be able to set healthy boundaries to protect your energetic space 
right? It's calling yourself out on your BS and facing kind of maybe what you're contributing to the situation and understanding that. Um, but really, it's just about continuing to show up for your best interest, even when you meet resistance. Um, but also, it's towing the line between that and, and meeting yourself where you are. So accepting that this is where you are right now, if it's not a super inspired place, if it's angry at someone else, um, just really acknowledging that and validating that for yourself and saying, you know what, it's okay. This is all information that I'm going to kind of dive into when I'm feeling better, but I'm feeling not great right now and that's fine. But what I'm going to do about it is I'm not going to sit here and let my mind take over, which it, like, it loves to do that. I mean, it's an evolutionary process. It's meant to keep us safe. It's meant to keep us psychologically and physically away from harm or distress <laughs> or painful feelings. So yeah, it'll really want to keep you in one place in bed or whatever, but really fight that resistance and say, you know what, I do think I can do one thing for myself today. And whether if, it, if you're in a really bad place, sometimes that just means putting on a fresh pair of clothes, right? Or taking a shower. Cause you know, that's like the first thing to go when we're really feeling down is like just taking care of our physical bodies. Um, maybe it means making a fresh meal for yourself or going outside and getting a walk, walking and getting, moving your body is a phenomenal way to get um, emotions out of your brain. Like it, I know that sounds weird, but it's like, it, it's, yeah, it's stored in the emotions are energy stored in your brain that it's trying to get out. So it, you need to move your body for sure. So go for a walk, get some fresh air, but whatever you do, just don't, don't sit in it because your mind will then start to play tricks on, on you. I'm sure as you can, excuse me, I'm sure as you can um, relate to, I mean, I've been there, it takes you down a, you know, a spiral. So just get out, move your body and connect with someone, whether it's a close friend or a family member, someone you really feel supported by and just let them know what's going on. Um, community is a huge part of mental wellness. So we cannot do this work alone. Make sure you reach out to someone um, that you feel really safe around and supported by and let them know what's happening and let them support you. Absolutely. I love all of those tips. I think it's so important. Whenever I find myself uh, going into negative spiral, you know, and like I just can feel that I start overthinking and like this negative thought patterns, it's the best thing ever to just either go out um, and do a hike or go dance or something like that. It definitely clears your brain, washes all of that stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's incredible. Your body knows how to heal itself. Absolutely. Like, let me repeat that. It knows how to heal itself. And like, if you would give it the right tools, it can, and it will, it wants to. Our bodies are always geared towards healing. Think about every time you've ever been injured, it, mm -hmm. it moves to heal itself. Yeah. So get out of your own way and let the body do its thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So let's talk about healing from past wounds, because again, I think it's interesting topic in that most of us feel like if nothing like major happened in life, right? When we are talking um, I don't know, rape or abuse or any type mm. of situation, if that never happened to us, then we almost dismiss the fact that we still have wounds and we still can be traumatized mm -hmm. um, by, by much smaller, but by much more minor events in our lives. But we still do. So, and I know that it looks different for every person, depending on the circumstances and how bad you were traumatized but in your work did you notice any kind of like underlying threads of how can we heal from those wounds and probably even uncover them because for the longest time I always thought of myself like oh I'm not traumatized I'm not wounded my life is great my life is good but I ended up having an anxiety anyway right and then as mm. I talked through it I've discovered that there were probably a couple of events minor events that still somehow were not processed correctly and were still mm -hmm. triggered a little bit so did you notice any kind of like underlying threats uh, across people and what kind of work can we do to help ourselves 
Yeah, absolutely. This is actually kind of the stuff I focus on because, um, you know, I grew up in a very nice house. I was financially taken care of in a very good way, you know, um, yep. and small things. And, you know, I had, you know, friends and I mean, I went through bullying and I went through things that really were considered not that bad. Like you said, like, you know, major traumas, living in a war zone, you know, being assaulted, being raped, things like that abuse, like very, like, you know, severe child abuse, like that's what we think of. And what's interesting is that just recently, I would say in the last 10 years, we are now starting to see what's being called complex trauma. And it's, it's in my opinion, um, and I think we're going to learn this more and more through the science, that everybody has complex trauma to some degree. And depending on your level of resiliency, your community, your ability to cope, we turn out different ways. And that's just like, let's take a look at it from a completely logical neurobiological perspective, right? So our brains, when we're younger, are like sponges. We're in a hypnotic state. The theta brain waves are the most active. Um, so we're absorbing and imprinting every single thing that happens to us. So things that are small, like your parent not showing up to pick you up from school and not knowing who was going to come get you, that can be a trauma. Even if you're in a great school in a great neighborhood and it's not a dangerous place, just the feeling of abandonment can leave a physical imprint on your brain structure. So your brain actually gets physically altered and it's through these many different events from the first, I would say, first, even in utero, this, it's been shown that it can change the brain. So, you know, through the utero process, probably until, you know, your early 20s, your brain is still kind of being changed and moved and like other parts are growing and different parts are dying off. And so like the physical structure of your brain is changing based on your life experiences. And, and the younger you are, the more dramatic it is. Um, so at, yeah, as adults, we're like, oh, that wasn't a trauma, but really for your brain, it was because it, it fit, the structure of it changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would you say that we can alter brain for the better? Obviously, the, the world will, will do its negative imprint, but what, what can we do uh, mindfully, you know, to ourselves to hopefully alter the brain for, for the better and to improve its function, really, in mental health and um, just intelligence in general? Yeah, so this is super fun and exciting. Um, you can <laughs> heal the you can heal the brain. Uh, it ha it's amazing. The brain has um, a regenerating um, ability, so it can actually grow new parts, and it does all the time. This is called neuroplasticity. So, for example, if you're learning a new language, you'll see gray matter in different parts of your brain growing that are in accordance with the language area. Um, but other parts, it also has this ability for allowing other parts that are not being used and it, it deems not essential to die off, which is why if you learn like a musical instrument as a child, let's say, and you were really good at it. And then now as an adult, you haven't played in, in a while and you could not sit down and do the same thing you did. It's because your brain is like, oh, we're not using this anymore. So we're going to get rid of it. So it lets it die. So that's essentially the theory behind healing kind of this complex and major trauma is that we grow the parts of the brain and strengthen the parts of the brain that support confidence, self-worth, self-love, um, happiness, um, emotional balance, uh, you know, all the good things that really support well-being. And we can actively work to allow the traumatized parts to die off by not, no longer repeating the same patterns that we were doing before that were continuing the, um, the, 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 that, uh, we're, we're, that we're allowing that part of the brain to continue growing, right? So for example, if we have like some trauma around relationships, like maybe our parents fought a lot, so maybe we see a pattern similar in our adult relationships, every time that you reenact that trauma, you are strengthening that neural connect connection so that that trauma becomes stronger and more influential in your unconscious world, which is how you kind of view the world through that lens is through your unconscious lens. So if that's not healed, <laughs> then you're going to continue to re-traumatize yourself. So it's like the active choice of choosing to do something different. Like I mentioned before, when you're triggered, taking that pause and deciding to do something different, um, that is that is the change. That is when you are strengthening the new part of the brain and you're allowing the other part to become unuseful and to die off. Absolutely. This is fascinating. Mm -hmm. But 
would you say it takes a lot of like self-awareness to even uncover these traumas or this kind of programming unconscious programming that doesn't really serve us anymore like you said you know mm -hmm. uh, let's say the parent the parents got divorced and so now you're reenacting this type of relationships you've seen in your family <clears throat> and you're projecting them onto your own relationships with new people so how how do you uncover those unconscious programming because really I, I in my experience it takes a lot of analysis and even sometimes an outside person like a therapist mm -hmm. say I am seeing a pattern here yeah you know um it, it really depends on the person of course the caveat for all of this information is it depends on you know who you are and what you're dealing with um, of course, you know, me being in this field and me being someone who, who really understands how heavy this work can be, because it can be, and it can trigger a lot of emotions. It can make us feel very unstable. Having a guide to hold your hand through this process is so invaluable. So if you can, you know, find someone to help you decode this so you don't have to do it alone. And you can also, because it's very confusing and it's very abstract and painful and it requires um, objective kind of analysis, like you said, and that can be very difficult if you have a lot of trauma, especially if you have a lot of trauma, I would work with someone to help you. Um, so, I mean, other than that, it's just, yeah, really about not being unafraid of becoming very self-aware and, and just look, and we all have the answers within us. We don't really need someone to pull it out. Our brain just does a really good job of kind of pushing it back so that we don't think about it. But if you were to sit down with a journal, um, which is studies have shown, it, it affects certain parts of the brain that help you release and um, remember things and release stored emotions and things like that and process. Um, if you sit in front of a journal and you ask yourself just like, what in my childhood stuck with me that I think affects me today? And you allow yourself to really think about it and just write freely. You're, you will have the answers within you. You'll be able to pick out the moments that have stuck with you or the, or the patterns you can say, like what patterns um, do I keep seeing? Like maybe you have a hard time making friends. Maybe you find yourself feeling anxious every day. Um, you know, like what are these patterns that are not working for me anymore? Because we want to look at the things that are no longer serving us figure out where they came from and then make a different choices. But yeah, so, so that's really what it is. It's becoming very self-aware and kind of leaning into the self-care and self-love as you do this um, kind of work. And if you can, I know it's, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to work with someone for sure. Um, if you can work with someone, that's great. But if not go on Instagram, there are so many amazing therapists and mental health professionals on there that are giving us so many free tools to do our own work. Um, so it's kind of like you can get a free therapist that way in many ways. Gabrielle is for sure one of these people and you will find her Instagram profile in the show notes below. Um, so I it's interesting that you brought up, you know, self-awareness and self-love. Yeah. You know that, and that's a biggie. That's a big one that I had to work on for a long time. Um, so yeah, you know, many of us really aren't taught how to love ourselves. Um, in fact, many of us aren't really taught how to even like ourselves. So the idea of self-love can, I've been told by other people and I felt it too, can be very overwhelming. Um, kind of, right like kind of this expectation you're like oh my god i don't love myself like i must be a bad person yeah. and it's like oh no um so really it's about meeting yourself for the first time and treating yourself like you would your best friend or your child if you have a child you know it's it's we did all of us fundamentally are good we do the best that we can with the situations we're born into and the parents we have or don't have. And I truly believe that if we really accept the fact that we are always doing the best that we can at all times with the tools that we have, we can forgive ourselves for everything, which the thing is when you, we, we walk around 95% of the time living in our unconscious. Right. So, and that is something that's like a statistic that's there's research behind it. We live in our subconscious and, um, you know, and because of that, we can't really blame ourselves uh, for the things that we do because we just didn't know. We don't know what we don't know. Right. So like, how can you, how could you blame someone if they just didn't know? So it's kind of like finding compassion. I think more than love, you start with compassion and you think about someone you really deeply love. Um, 
you know, for me, I think about my mom. <laughs> I love her so much. Um, so, you know, I think about like, well, what would I say to her if she was beating herself up for something she did when she really was doing her best? You know, and I'd say that to myself. And it's kind of approaching yourself in this way because we have a really funny way of letting our inner critic take over. And the inner critic is just the brain kind of yapping about trying to get us to like stay safe. <laughs> That's really all it is. <laughs> It actually isn't even our voice. So um, it's kind of learning that that's not your voice. The critic isn't who you are at your core. Your highest self always loves and supports you unconditionally. And it's just stepping into that belief system. I love it. I absolutely love it. So are there any specific tips or tools we can use to leverage neuroplasticity and also increase resilience? That I love, love, love um, getting into morning routines. So um, part of that includes every morning doing five items of gratitude and speaking out loud five affirmations, repeating them each about three to five times. And um, so that uses neuro-linguistic programming um, and your reticular activating system to really program your brain to start to think differently and in a way that supports your growth and your happiness. So if you're going to do anything, five items of gratitude, five affirmations every single day, you'll see within a couple of weeks, you'll have a dramatically different perspective and feeling about your, your life just from doing that. Um, I think also a big thing is processing and checking in with yourself throughout the day, you know, and forgiving yourself regularly, <laughs> like make it a habit. Um, check in, ask yourself, okay, what am I doing today? Do I need to give myself some extra time? Do I get anxious around these events or this particular thing? Or do I not want to see this person? Or really asking yourself like you would, I guess, almost like your child, <laughs> like, hey, is this okay with you? Like, is everything okay? Are you okay? How are you? What do you need? You know, and kind of really leaning into that every single day. And then when you make a mistake or you're late for something, or instead of beating yourself up, Noticing that and saying, you know what, things happen. I can change how I do this next time so that maybe it doesn't happen, but I'm okay. Like, it's all good. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person because something went wrong. I'm still a great person. And it's just something to learn from. So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like that checking in, journaling, affirmations, gratitude attitude um, and surrounding yourself with a supporting community. If you feel like anybody in your life, if you ask yourself, what are they contributing? contributing to my happiness? What are they contributing to my life? And you can't, like, what, what value do they bring? Um, and you can't think of anything. And what comes to mind is just a lot of suffering. Think about that relationship and whether it's working for you. Um, Absolutely. Of, yeah, we do often um, repeat traumatizing patterns in our friendships too. So mm -hmm. friendships are sometimes formed over trauma bonds. So be really careful about who you're around and what energy they have and what their mindset is. And like, just take note and, and choose for yourself. Don't be afraid to go on your own for a little bit and really turn within and honor yourself in that way and create, actively choose, because you can, who you surround yourself with and what you want to do and how you want to show up every day in a way that is in alignment with your values and what you want from life and you can't go wrong. Great. That's a great advice. So my last kind of question is we've talked a lot about neuroscience and all kinds of like western psychology neurobiology and stuff like that how do you combine mm -hmm. that with ancient eastern philosophies and practices right like you said mindfulness mm -hmm. meditation i found yoga is doing amazing things to our body oh yeah and so how do you combine the two i guess yeah, so what's super cool is because I'm such a nerd, I like love reading all the research and making sure that things have a real solid foundation um, so that they work. Uh, meditation and mindfulness, there's so much amazing research and yoga now, uh, they call it somatic therapies. Um, so yeah, so I absolutely include meditation and mindfulness. I teach people really how to become the third party observer of their own life <laughs> and kind of really reach a place of, of peace where they can kind of observe things without judgment and make 
conscious choices and cre like create their dream life. So, um, so that's something I do. I also really encourage people, um, you know, medication. I took medication for depression. I'm not against it. I think it's a life saving. I think they're life saving drugs. Um, but I do also really believe in, um, because I have experienced this and I've done this for myself and I've had clients do this as well. And lots of other people have done this, but including like a really rich, um, nutrient dense foods, like including those in your diet and making sure you're taking your gut, taking care of your gut biome holistically in that way. If you look at Ayurvedic practices, they do tongue scraping to get rid of bacteria. They do colonics. Um, which are really powerful for cleaning your, your intestinal bacteria, which also contributes to your gut biome. Um, so, I mean, I don't like, and ashwagandha also is a nervous system regulator. It's an herb. So there's a lot of different ancient Chinese and Ayurvedic and um, different kinds of uh, Eastern uh, herbs and practices and philosophies, like the Buddhist Eightfold Path is really beautiful if you're looking to connect with values, um, you know, that I really include depending on who the person is and what they're called to do. Absolutely. This is a great advice and we'll definitely recommend our listeners to check all of those great resources and practices. Awesome. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank you so much. And I think this this is a complete uh, wealth of information. And there is just so, so many good tips and tricks. And I hope that this will help a lot of people to uh, be a little bit more self-aware, self-loving. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We got to get, we got to get the healing out there guys. No one's going to do it for us and we deserve <laughs> to be happy. So let's just, let's just do it. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you've learned a lot of new strategies. Be sure to check out the notes below this episode for additional resources and tools mentioned in today's show. I would love to keep the conversation going. Share your thoughts and takeaways with me on social media channels, wherever you are. And do not forget to tag me. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you, and I will see you on the next episode. If this podcast has helped you even a little bit, please leave a review and subscribe so that we can help spread the message together.